Good morning. Welcome to the UNC Core Center for Clinical Research Speaker Spirit Series. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for this presentation. Our presenter today is Dr. Linda Lee. Dr. Lee is a professor, the Arthritis Society Chair, and the Canada Research Chair in Patient-Oriented Knowledge Translation at the University of British Columbia. She is also a senior scientist at Arthritis Research Canada. Many of us in our CCCR have had the pleasure of collaborating with Linda or working with her on committees and uh, in other workshops or webinars, and we are delighted to have her join us today. Her presentation today is titled, Rethinking Physical Activity Promotion in a 24-Hour Day of People with Arthritis. Dr. Lee, whenever you're ready to begin, please do. Thank you, Dr. Callahan, and thank you so much for the kind invitation and the introduction for today, and, uh, and thank you everyone for joining the session. So let me um, share my screen first. Hopefully you can see my presentation view, not my presenter view. If it's okay, can someone give me an indication that looks, looks okay? Good. Thank you. So um, good morning, everyone. Um, I think um, it would be appropriate, first of all, to um, acknowledge where I am speaking to you from. So um, my name is Linda Lee, and I, um, I'm speaking from um, the really the traditional and ceded the ancestral territories of Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nation. Um, it is important to recognize our First Nations land and, uh, and tradition and, and where we, I am right now is the, now is known as Vancouver, British Columbia, um, where my team can have the privilege to do our work. So what I will do today is to start by framing physical activity promotion um, as an implementation challenge. Then what I'll talk about um, is the need to shift the thinking from helping patients to perhaps just focusing on specific physical activity goals to, to a larger, broader perspective of focusing on the 24 hour day. And I'll also talk about um, how to use an implementation science lens to approach physical activity promotion in our patient population. I'll um, end with a few ideas for the future as well. Um, so this talk is about 35 minutes. And uh, what I really want to do is to uh, have some time at the end to hear your thoughts and perhaps to answer a few questions. Now this talk is based on an editorial that we publish in the Journal of Rheumatology in April. And I would like to um, acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Lynn Feehan, who has, uh, who, who, who has tremendous expertise in objective physical activity measures, as well as Alison Holmes, who is a physical therapy knowledge broker, but she's also um, a practicing physio physiotherapist. There's a lot of teaching in, uh, in university and also a person living with rheumatoid arthritis. Now, even maybe we're just sick and tired of COVID-19, there is no question that life as we know it has changed since about 20 months ago, when the World Health Organization declared a pandemic in March, 2020. Shortly after that, countries around the world declared states of emergency as we, we remember, um, which trigger measures to support responses in, um, uh, to the pandemic. Now, some of these measures have posed new barriers for people with, um, with arthritis especially to manage their health and their daily activities. Now, um, in, uh, we, we've seen an increasing number of articles that's really you know, publishing, um, uh, talking about um, experiences and challenges people have encountered. And I've um, uh, show a few here in this slide. Um, Michelle, in uh, early 2020, published a study that looked at about um, 530 people with arthritis, majority of them with rheumatoid arthritis, but really talked about how difficult it was to ne negotiate and navigate the environment at the early stage of the pandemic. So with the change or the chance of um, uh, contracting COVID-19 unclear during that time, 
um, especially for people using immunosuppressive medication. Many people avoid physical activities like going to your grocery stores or pharmacies um, visits in order to reduce their exposure um, in public spaces, especially early in the pandemic. Um, gyms and swimming pools were closed, so leaving people without access to their regular exercise facilities. And even when facilities reopened, as local transmission was getting under control, some people were actually quite cautious about resuming indoor and group exercise routines, as um, one of our uh, uh, doctoral students, um, Jenny Lees, uh, Dr. Jenny Lees now, um, it, uh, she just finished her PhD, um, did a in-depth qualitative um, interview study in people, people with um, rheumatoid arthritis, trying to understand sort of um, what are the concerns and worries for them to resume the physical activity and exercise, even when um, in, in, at the time when the disease was um, under a bit, more, uh, a bit more control. So this unprecedented situation has really challenged how health professionals support people with arthritis to stay physically active. Now, for more than a decade, the message of physical activity promotion has been um, centered on achieving concrete goals, like reaching at least 150 minutes of um, physical activity, uh, moderate vigorous level physical activity, and include strength training at least two days a week for um, anyone older uh, uh, than the age of uh, 18. And of course, for older adults, it also encouraged people to um, include multi-component physical activities that includes balanced training for falls prevention. Now, these recommendations are the same for people with arthritis, as we know. Um, and, and there's no question that being active is good for our joint, our heart, and our mind. Now, during the pandemic, um, the WHO was nice enough to simplify the um, message to say that, you know, just move. Every move counts, more is better. And I also want to highlight the work by uh, Dr. Dan White's group, and all, who also recommends that, you know, for people with arthritis, perhaps we can start slow, start small. Um, you know, you can walk about 10 minutes a day and gradually increase the duration and the speed. And this kind of graded approach is um, really helpful and excellent recommendation. Now, but we also know that many people are just simply not active enough to reach health benefits. Now, it is now recognized that if we just simply telling people to exercise, it's not going to work most of the time for people who are not already active. So it seems that the challenge here is not about telling patients what to do, but how to support them to start and stay physically active. Now, prescribing exercise and promoting physical activity are the classic example of a complex intervention. So essentially, the treatment seems simple enough. You know, someone with, say, knee osteoarthritis, knee pain, come in, get an assessment, and, you know, the health professional will recommend, you know, if the right type, right dose, right frequency, you know, in terms of what exercise or what physical activity um, is the best for this person. But we also know that the success of this type of treatment really depends on how it's being delivered. So for example, does the um, exercise professional, the, the clinician has the time to explain how to do the exercise, you know, in, in, a, uh, in a way that um, people can understand? Um, do they have the time to help people to set up a plan that is achievable for them to be physically active? Does the health professional actually know how to tailor intervention for, um, for the individual? Now, as we know, working with someone with knee osteoarthritis, say someone who's 50 year old, knee osteoarthritis, you know, having quite a bit of discomfort, um, but otherwise healthy, um, it's quite different from working with someone who's 75 years old with knee osteoarthritis, plus two other comorbid conditions and an early stage of frailty very different population. Now, when we're delivering exercise and physical activity, of course, what we say matters, 
how we say it matters. The tone matters, the choice of words matters. Can, can the clinician actually connect with the individual so that the individual will receive and understand the message? All of those matters. So when we apply an implementation science lens, we are really focusing on the person who delivered the treatment and how to support them to do the task. Now, people may wonder, you know, well, I heard of the terms knowledge dissemination, translation, mobilization, and now you're talking about implementation. What do you mean by implementation? So perhaps let me take a moment uh, for us to be on the same page. So Dr. Jeffrey Curran recently published uh, a debate paper in implementation science communications. And if you have not um, seen this article and uh, in are, um, are interested in the, in the field of implementation science, I would recommend that you take a look at this paper. It's a great read, does not take long, excellent um, um, uh, writing, explaining about um, terms related to implementation. So, uh, I find it, per I personally find it very helpful. Now he used the simple terms like the thing and do the thing. So the thing really refers to um, intervention or a practice that is needed, uh, or that is in need of support. So for example, counseling patients to be physically active. It's a complex intervention. You know, um, sometimes health professionals may need support to, to, um, to, to deliver that effectively. So to help clinicians to do the thing, some stuff may need to be done to support them in, overcome, uh, in overcoming barriers. So stuff, the stuff is what we call an implementation strategy. So using the example of physical activity counseling, strategies like providing clinicians with an interactive training um, in behavior change techniques, having access to tools to plan and support counseling practices, or providing opportunities to see patients' physical activity data. So for example, if the patient is using a wearable device, a fitness tracker, clinicians can actually see how, they, how they're doing over a um, period of time. All of those can actually help clinicians can do their thing better. So when it comes to um, studying the, um, uh, the effectiveness or how these um, type of strategies help clinicians to, um, to, to, um, uh, do the, to, to deliver physical activity intervention. So um, scientists like myself look at um, effectiveness of implementation strategy. We are, the, we are doing implementation science. So when we're studying how we do the thing, it is implementation science. So hopefully that helps to um, explain a little bit what we're talking about here. So one of the challenge for health professionals to tailor their physical activity recommendations is the fact that people spend their time in different ways. Now, for example, um, Dr. Lynn Feehan in our group analyzed the 24 hour profile of people with arthritis um, in uh, um, our studies um, where people were eligible for our physical activity counseling intervention. So um, in our eligibility criteria were quite comprehensive. So we actually expected a, a pretty homogeneous group um, that was relatively sedentary. But what was interesting was that we uh, did latent class analysis and we found that there were actually four distinct profiles ranging from people who, who are actually living a you know, pretty balanced lifestyle. Um, they, they still said too much, spending about um, 9.4 hours, more, more than nine hours a day um, in sitting. But we also found people who um, are sitting a lot in the day, but in different ways. So we have people who are, um, you know, the high sitters who spend about 13 hours a day on average in a seated position, very sedentary. But we also found people who sit a lot, but with different patterns in sleeping. So we have people who um, tend to sleep more than others. So on average, about uh, more than eight hours a day. And we also have people who don't, who didn't sleep enough, about six and a half hours a day. So 
It, so with people actually spending their days quite differently, even in a study that we expect to have, you know, a pretty similar group of um, individuals um, in, in, um, in, in our participants, it makes sense that when ther therapists counseling patients to focus primarily on just making plans to be more active without looking at what else that they do in the 24 hour days, they may not actually get the expected result from everyone they have canceled. So the findings like from Dr. Feehan's study really suggest that people may need a different strategy to achieve healthy balance between physical activity, rest and sleep. So for example, um, sleep related interventions may be needed uh, as a physical activity promotion strategy in people who sleep too much or too little. So while people who sleep too much may benefit from shifting some of their sleep time to any level of physical activity based on their ability, those who sleep too much may focus on gaining more sleep time or and walking time by reducing their seated time. So the strategies need to look different. So these examples really um, challenge our current thinking of what is the thing in physical activity promotion. Now, this is why it, for me, it was really exciting um, when the 24 hour movement guidelines for adults were released in Canada that came out in October last year. So by focusing on the balance in activities in a 24 hour day, clinicians and implementation scientists can begin to design strategies that tailor their support for patients uh, according to their ability to engage in physical activity. So as I mentioned, it was released in October, 2020. These guidelines promote a balance of um, activity, rest and sleep as playing an important role for better overall health and quality of life, regardless of the person's age and health condition. People are encouraged to shift their sedentary time to engage in physical activity at any level whenever they are able while maintaining a healthy amount of sleep. And you can see that in, um, as I mentioned here, for um, individual adults uh, between 18 to 64, healthy amount of sleep is about seven to nine hours. And I'm not going to com even comment on how, you know, how many of us are actually reading, uh, reaching that target. Um, I, I didn't last night. Um, and um, for people who are uh, over the age of 65, about seven to eight hours uh, a day is considered to be healthy. What is also important is that um, for sedentary time, resting is not a bad thing, but doing too much is not good. So um, around eight hours a day is uh, uh, on average is uh, what is considered acceptable. And within those eight hours, it should be less than uh, three hours or less uh, is spent on screen time. So that actually gives an idea that how much we can um, target. Um, and for people with arthritis, this approach may be more acceptable, especially during the pandemic, when people's activity patterns may change and depending on their local pandemic response plan and their personal preferences. It also highlights the importance of clinicians to address sleep, and fatigue when they're co-designing a physical activity intervention with their patients. So with these new guidelines, recommendations, knowledge tools, it helps for us to you know, start reimagine how to do this thing about promoting physical activity. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the success of promoting the balance activity profile depends partly on how the intervention is delivered. Now, this is uh, from a study um, from Dr. Jasmine Ma, who just finished a postdoctoral fellow with us. And she, uh, this is a systematic review of 24 studies that looked at the influence of behavior change techniques on the effects of physical activity interventions. And she found that strategies that included self-monitoring with feedback on performance, performance had the highest effect on physical activity behavior compared to strategies that use other behavior change techniques, which is very interesting. She also found a moderate effect in strategies that included 
problem solving and action planning as compared to interventions that use other behavior change uh, techniques. <clears throat> so these findings really suggest that maybe we should start thinking about or, or focus a bit more on multifaceted approaches um, in order to support people to be more active. So since 2015, our group has been working with uh, patient partners and clinicians to develop a program that it, uh, includes education sessions, the use of a Fitbit, and physical uh, therapist counseling uh, by phone uh, based on the brief action planning approach. We have also developed an app um, called FitVis, and that um, th at the time when we tested it, it was um, more um, of a conceptual tool rather than a really polished app. Um, and so, what we were um, tr trying, to, what we were doing was that we um, used this app uh, to enable therapists to set physical activity parameters remotely um, for their patients uh, based on their symptoms. So, so that the patients can then get feedback automatically when they were um, doing physical activities, whether they're being too active for too long or too short, or they're doing too little or too much, which is, I, I think is particularly relevant for people with severe osteoarthritis or inflammatory arthritis when energy conservation is important when um, uh, they have active disease. In a series of studies um, that you see on this slide, we have demonstrated that it was feasible to implement the program in the community. Um, and it was also effective in increasing people's physical activity time um, after eight to 12 weeks of interventions in people with arthritis. So our results contribute to a growing body of evidence that um, an individualized tailored approach is the best when supporting people with chronic disease to be active. This study uh, you're seeing here is a review published in 2019 by a group in Australia, including 26 studies. And they concluded that while wearable interventions are uh, a wearable only interventions show a trend um, in improving time spent in physical activity. Multifaceted interventions such as ours uh, pro produce a stronger result. So we are now learning more about how physical therapists and exercise professionals can use wearables to um, support people to be more active. But of course, there's, there, there's still a lot that we need to learn and understand about how to tailor interventions. So currently we are running a six month randomized control trial uh, with a six month follow-up on the use of um, an a new app called Opress, and Opress was spill off FitVis, that, um, the, the, uh, the conceptual tool that we've developed. Um, and the goal is to improve self-care capacity in people with rheumatoid arthritis in this particular study. Um, and, and also uh, we want to see whether it helps people to increase the time they spend in physical activity. The participants use the app to track their symptoms, their medication use, uh, and also any important events that are related to their health. And the Fitbit tracks their physical activity and everything uh, that's tracked um, either um, by self-report or automatically by, by their wearable are visualized on, um, on, on, on the app um, that we uh, develop. So an important feature of this app is that it has a health professional portal, which allows users to give permission for the clinician to see their track profile. And it has an interface to streamline um, for the health professional to deliver their counseling uh, component. So they can actually document um, what was being discussed, the, uh, the, uh, the goal that's being set and the plan that's being developed. And the therapist can type it you know, um, in, in a remote location and it will show up in the, um, the, the individual's mm -hmm. personal app. At the beginning of the pandemic, we adapted our in-person interaction of the, um, of the uh, education component of the intervention to online delivery. 
we were able to get uh, ethics approval and participant consent, uh, fortunately, to record these counseling session. And here you can see that this is a practice session that um, during the transition that um, one of our research uh, coordinator on the left is uh, demonstrating how to set up the Fitbit. And um, the screen on the right um, is demonstrating how the uh, patient participants will see um, their their um, their, their um, operas um, information. So moving forward, what we are doing uh, is to um, do conduct further analysis on these Zoom video recording so that we can explore the association between how therapists deliver the action planning component, what can be improved um, and, and, um, and what can be streamlined um, and, and how that associate with individuals, uh, patients, behavioral and health outcomes. So more to come. I also want to mention that during the pandemic uh, at the beginning, we've heard from patients um, the challenges that they have encountered about managing their health in general. So after consulting with our patient partners in our project, we have made modifications on operas, which is now open to everyone to, um, who wants to monitor their rheumatoid arthritis symptoms and uh, disease activity and the physical activity as well. And they can, they can sync their own Fitbit with the, um, with the app if they like. So our goal is um, also to collect data to look at the impact of the pandemic um, on people with rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see here that um, on the uh, right hand side, one of our patient partners tweeted uh, about the, um, the operas um, study and, and the tool itself. And you can see that she's wearing her Fitbit and getting infusion treatment at the same time. And we're grateful for all the support from our patient partners um, to promote the study. I'm going to end by sharing a few thoughts on um, where we may, we may go from here, um, you know, after hearing, you know, some of the work that we do and um, some of the new developments about um, how, uh, physical activity promotion. So um, first, I, I would like to suggest that it is really a time to invest in developing and testing strategies to support the delivery of physical activity interventions. And I underline delivery. So how do we support clinicians to do their work, their tasks better? Secondly, I think we need to start update the, our thinking about the role of rehabilitation in arthritis care from how we currently know it. And while we're moving forward, I think we need to be mindful about the in, uh, potential inequities that exist in promoting physical activity. So for the first point, so I would suggest that promoting a balanced 24 hour day is not just exercise professionals responsibility, but it's everyone's responsibility. Um, rheumatologists, family doctors, nurses, pharmacists, social worker, psychologists, you know, if I miss anyone, I apologize. But anyone who work with the patients in a variety of uh, settings in the private sector, in the public sector, everyone, we are all in a position to provide activity counseling. Um, and, and I think especially for those with complex health condition, in addition to their osteoarthritis or inflammatory arthritis, they particularly need the counseling. There are actually quite, um, quite a bit of training on brief action planning approach available um, that, can be, uh, that used to be offered in person, but because of the pandemic, a lot of the online tools um, are available for rheumatology professionals. So, so those are some of the things that I think we can um, think about um, investing more into um, to improve um, clinical practice. So I think the question also is that from an implementation science lens, what kind of stuff that we need to think about, need to develop to support clinicians to do the thing better, to help patients to stay active. And I would suggest that perhaps one place to start is to consider or reconsider the role of rehabilitation in arthritis management, which is my second point. Now, so, the um, WHO defines rehabilitation as a process that aims to enable people with disability to reach and maintain 
um, the, their uh, optimal functional level. So central to this definition is that this is a time limiting a time limited process that ends when the treatment goals are reached. So traditionally, rehabilitation are either consider um, remedial or adaptive. So basically, we focus on restoring capacity or to provide um, uh, uh, adaptive devices or recommendations or ways to compensate things that uh, the person has lost in terms of their capacity. Now, the definition by um, the definition, however, really fall, falls a little short when addressing chronic conditions, as we know. Now, within the uh, current concept of rehabilitation, a person would receive their physical activity counseling or their exercise therapy until the treatment goals are reached. And at that time, the person is discharged. Now, treatment is only resumed when the person experienced the next health episode. Now, this model is problematic because it leaves no room for health professionals to monitor, give feedback, refine the physical activity plan over the course of the disease. And so the current concept of rehabilitation may actually be quite limiting to our patients. Now, during the pandemic, we have seen an unprecedented use of virtual care, especially in rheumatology. With more access to wearable devices, knowledge and personal health data in, hands, in the hands of patients, I think arthritis care is really starting to change from the health professional deciding when to see a patient to a model in which the patient can identify and control when they need to see a health professional. And I think this shift would enable health professionals to be able to be more responsive to um, patients' need to achieve a balance of sleep, rest, and being active. My last point is about supporting people to be um, active using an equity lens. There are a number of behavior change models um, that are useful for clinicians to develop strategies to support patients to be more physically active. Some of you may be familiar with the Calm B um, framework or model, which is comprehensive and easy to use. Essentially, it says that in order for the person to do a, a task, we need to consider the, whether they're capable, whether they have the opportunity, and whether, and whether they have the motivation. But I think it is also important to be mindful that people's capability, opportunity, and motivations are often shaped by their life context based on their demographic characteristics, their society, uh, other societal factors, and their living conditions. So as we move forward to improve on how to deliver physical activity interventions, it is also important, I think, to consider who may benefit from the intervention and what needs to be done to ensure it reaches populations who are harder to reach. Now, many of you may be familiar with the Progress Plus framework. Um, it's often used in rheumatology. I like it, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll mention it here. Um, Progress stands for a number of things, uh, place of residence, race and ethnicity, um, uh, occupation, gender, religion, um, education, socioeconomic status, social capital and network. Later on, age, disability and uh, sexual orientation were also added to the grid of the Progress Plus uh, framework. Now the framework is great because it offers a useful filter to identify determinants of inequity, which can in turn inform a more holistic approach when we um, design strategies to support patients to be more active. And finally, I think for clinicians, I think one thing that perhaps we can start doing today is to begin perhaps by asking uh, each of the um, physical activity conversations with our patients by asking, how do you spend your time in a typical weekday? And how do you spend your time in a typical day in a weekend? 
These simple questions can give opportunities to gather relevant contextual information to develop a realistic 24 hour um, activity and sleep plan with our patients and helps to identify um, the support that is required to put it in action. So in summary, um, I think changing behavior is, is really complex and um, sometimes additional effort is needed to support patients to move more, sit less and get a healthy amount of sleep. The pandemic has imposed unusual challenges on the self-care activities of patients with arthritis, but it also presents unique opportunities for the rheumatology community to embrace a more holistic approach so that we can support patients to integrate more physical activity in, in their daily lives. I would also suggest that um, with the changing landscape in rehabilitation, it is the right time to invest more in studying how we do the thing because evidence-based rehabilitation needs evidence-based implementation in order for us to serve our patients better. I'm gonna end by acknowledging some, a number of important people in particular, the patient partners, without them, none of the work is possible. And some of the ideas that really um, came from conversations with these wonderful um, individuals, patient partners who generous, generously give up their time to, um, to, to speak with us, um, as well as the investigators, trainees, and staff members. Thank you. And I'm happy to um, take questions and hear your thoughts. <laughs>